Hey, what's happening? Welcome, everybody. It is Monday, December 13th, and it is another episode of Let There Be Talk, brought to you by Cactus Radio Network, my podcast network. You can find all of my podcasts, Dark Fonzie, At Home with Byron Katie, The Grail, and Let There Be Talk at cactusradionetwork.com. Absolutely free. Let's kick into it. It is a great, great day here. Full-blown legend is joining me, Mr. Steve Cropper, the colonel himself from Booker T and the MGs. I can't even tell you. I'm, I, I could sit here for an hour and name off this guy's credits, and it still wouldn't cover it all. He played guitar with Otis Redding, Wilson Pickett, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, the Blues Brothers. He's uh, produced Jeff Beck. He's worked with everybody i mean everybody bob dylan i mean come on man it's just crazy but the stacks recording that catalog and booker t and the mgs it's just the iconic just perfect rhythm and blues group just insane I first saw Booker T and the MGs. I mean, I knew about them, of course, from uh, the Blues Brothers. But I got to see them live in 93, I believe, at the Shoreline when they were doing a tour as the backing band for Neil Young. And I got to tell you, uh, I, I, I tell him on this episode, I've told many people, there was nothing cooler than seeing Booker T and the MGs play stuff like Cowgirls in the Sand, Cinnamon Girl. I mean, you could go to YouTube and and plug it in and just check it out. It is so fucking cool. Anyway, Steve Cropper here today. Come on, man. How cool is that? 80 years old, just still killing it. He's got a brand new record that came out a few months ago fire it up and he got nominated for grammy man fingers crossed that he gets it because this record's great 80 years old nominated for a grammy doesn't get any cooler than that what else is happening well if you follow me on instagram or you are uh, part of the dale razor family you know what's happening i'm about to get on a plane and head up to san francisco and do something that I've been wanting to do for 40 years, and that is open for the greatest band ever, Metallica. I can't even tell you what this means to me. Of course, anybody that knows me well, it, it knows how blown away I am. And to be asked to do this, it's, it's nerve wracking. I don't know how it's going to go, but I know that... Uh, I'm ready for it. If it goes bad, it'll be funny. Not funny, but it'll be a a crazy story. And if it goes great, it'll be just incredible. Either way, I am going to open for Metallica on their 40-year anniversary shows. I went to the 30-year anniversary shows. And I'll tell you, they were some of the greatest shows I ever saw. They were at the Fillmore. And I remember the first night they opened with Call of Cthulhu. And I, I, I had like tears in my eyes. I, I was in the corner. And I didn't want anybody to see me. But I was like, these fucking guys are the heroes, man. It's a, it's a big responsibility, man. I, I want to fucking kill for them. I don't know what to do. I've opened for Alice in Chains for a couple of weeks. And it, it was fun and wild. I'm definitely a better comedian since that happened, and I, I did okay on that run. Some shows were fucking weird because the people were walking around with beers, talking to their buddies, looking at you like, what, what's this roadie doing talking to me? But uh, holy shit, I cannot wait to be in that room, the Chase Arena. I was there a couple years ago to see Dead & Co. Had no idea that I would be back in there opening for Metallica. It's going to be wild. It's going to be wild. I'll talk more about it on my Patreon. You can join the Patreon for bonus episodes and Zoom Fest. Patreon.com slash Dean Del Rey. Everything helps. Believe me. Keep this network going. Chugging along. 
And uh, I appreciate all of the Patreoners. 117 bonus episodes, I believe. And a lot of Zoom fests all through COVID, all the way up to the last couple of weeks. We have been doing some uh, nighttime Zoom hangs. So Dean Del Rey is the Patreon. Also, merch. A lot of new merch up there. If you want to get some uh, Gertie hoodies or the Perry Shaw Dean Del Rey shirt or the Dark Fonzies, they're up at DeanDelRay.com. Christmas is here. We'll get these shirts out immediately to you. Order them while they're there. A lot of new tour dates for 2022 and 2021, the end here. Of course, this weekend in San Francisco with Metallica, following week, I will be in Arizona December 30th with Bill Burr two nights, the mighty Burr. And uh, then in, uh, I think, January or so, two nights in Springfield, Illinois, I'll be in Palm Springs, Las Vegas, Campbell, California, Fort Collins, Colorado, a lot of tour dates coming up. New Patreoners, Kevin Porter, thank you. Meet old as fuck. Old as fuck is a Patreoner. John Walling and Goki. I love you guys. All right, let's get into it. Man, the legend is here. The candles are lit. Mr. Groove Machine himself, the Colonel, Steve Cropper. <laughs> Steve Cropper. Wow, dude. Wow. You know, people throw legend around. They throw it around these days, like to anybody, which is ridiculous. Because well, it- let's just put it this way. I spent most of my lifetime in the music business trying to hide all that stuff. Why? I didn't ever want to be a superstar. Because you're a superstar overnight, and then you're gone overnight. Yeah. And I lasted a long time by doing what I did best. <laughs> my God. My God. They say I'm humble. Maybe I am. I don't know. But uh, but that was on purpose. (laughs) Stay out of the limelight, please. (laughs) I've got so many friends that were here. Some of them are still here. Some of them have been gone for years. Yeah. Out of the business. Yeah. Maybe they made. I just always said they made so much money. They got out and didn't care. They're having a big time. (laughs) (laughs) I tell you, uh, when I got the offer to interview you, I was so fired up. I have. uh, I've been a fan since I was young, you know, of course the, the hundreds of songs that you've played guitar on or wrote or recorded is just ridiculous. So the ones, you know, that I wrote, uh, you know, I never took anything from anybody. So about, I have been given credit on something I had really nothing to do with, but I'm very proud of things when I'm in the studio and I put a groove on something and it sells. Then I feel like I've really accomplished something. Yeah. Yeah. I saw you with neil young and the booker t and the mgs uh tour. pretty good tour <laughs> listen i talk about it all the time to this day that was back in like 92 93 and i'm a huge neil young guy huge and the way that the mgs grooved his songs was absolutely mind-boggling and the way the groove completely changed the flavor of neil Young's songs it's crazy And I've said this over and over, you add a different member into the band, say a drummer, and it totally changes the flavor. But when you add the MGs to your band, oh, my God. (laughs) Well, I can tell you about that tour. It was voted the number one tour of the year that year. But Neil Young got so much hate mail from his, you know, crazy horse fans that he had to cancel it. That was it. So he just dropped out. He was having a ball up there, but his. Some of his older fans did not like what we were doing. We were too slick for him. For Neil, we weren't too slick at all. We were just perfect, I guess. It worked out real good. And uh, his uh, producer, uh, David Briggs, was just every after every show said, my God, you guys get better and better and better. So we did what we did. It, it, it blew my mind. I'm, I'm telling you this right oh, now. Oh, I'm glad somebody really liked it. <laughs> oh, oh, my God. Well, I'm such a... Uh, an old school R&B soul guy at the same time that I'm a rock and roll guy. I mean, of course, Otis is one of the greatest singers of all time. There's no argument of that. But all of the stacks and Motown stuff, especially uh, that era of, you know, Temptations, Otis, uh, Wilson Pickett, all of that stuff, 
it is insane to think about the amount of songwriting that was going on, especially these days where a band maybe writes like three or four songs and then they bring in some outside writers. The amount of songwriting that was churning out of stacks is crazy. It's great. <laughs> I don't know what we had. I really don't know what we had. But, I, you know, the teamwork of Hayes and Porter, David Porter and Isaac Hayes was incredible. And there were the We Three what a great group of people. We were all in it for the same purpose, to get a hit record. That's all we cared about, getting a hit record. Something that you hear on the radio all the time, being number one was meant everything to us, much more than royalty. We didn't do it for money. We did it because we loved the music. I played music for years, and my guitar choice is 100% 52 Blackguard Esquire. I think it's the greatest blue-collar rock and roll soul machine made. And you played Esquire. So you had a 55. I absolutely love the Esquire. One pickup. That's all you need. And uh, how did that come about with you? Did you have other guitars before that? The original one, the one on Green Onions and a lot of the original Otis stuff uh, came about because it was on Sabres. It wasn't much. And I stripped it down and, and went to Western Auto in those days. Instead of A's Hardware, I went to Western Auto, same kind of deal. And got a can of candy apple red. That was a popular color in those days. But I didn't know that much to prime it. So I didn't prime it. And it turned purple. <laughs> the color had <laughs> <it> turned purple. <laughs> and somebody said, man, that's cool. Leave it like that. I was going to get another can of paint. They said, no, leave it, leave it purple. So I had it purple for years. I have pictures of it, but I do not have that guitar. And there's a reason that I don't have that guitar. Now, on, on Dock of the Bay, years later, I had one more Stratocaster that I bought way back when. And I used that to do the guitar licks, the electric guitar licks on that song because I thought the Esquire sound, the one pickup, would do the deal. And the last time I talked to Otis, he said, I'll see you Monday. And that was a Friday afternoon. I was just setting up to do the overdubs. So he never heard that, never heard the ocean waves, never heard the gulls and all that stuff. Man. Weird, but anyway, that guitar, the the it's painted white, blonde, you know, from Fender, is at the Smithsonian, and they have it on display up there in Washington D.C. Wow! And the purple one, uh, where's the purple one? I have no idea where it is. And uh, the people that might have known died three months before I went searching for it. Wow! Wow! Uh, so it got stolen or something? Well, it's a long story, but I'll try to make it as short as I can. Jimmy King had his guitar that he played with the bar case in the shop. And he came to me and said, Steve, you got a guitar I can borrow? And I thought I wasn't using that purple one anymore. So just take that purple guitar. And I thought it went down in the plane. Well, months later, Ben Colley, who was the only survivor, the trumpet player, was the only survivor of that plane crash, said he went, he went over to say to Jimmy King's mother how, how bad he missed Jimmy and he was sorry that he had gone down the plane and all that sort of stuff. So he came to me and Ben Collar came to me and he said, you know, that purple guitar you have? I said, yeah. He said, Jimmy's mother has that on her wall. I said, really? Well, go tell her that that's my guitar and not Jimmy's guitar. So what happened was I researched a little bit and found out that they fixed his guitar. He picked it up, but he didn't have time to bring mine back. So he just dropped it at his mother's house and a pair of jeans. She thought it belonged to him and I can't blame her. So when Ben Collett went over there and said, the guitar you have on the wall belongs to Steve Cropper, she fainted. And I said, leave it on the wall. Wow. <laughs> when I found out how important it was, I sent him and some other people over there to, to find it. To, I tell you, they said that he died three months before. The only guy that was, that was left alive was the dad who left Jimmy years ago. And he had died also. So there's nobody around. So I, I imagine guitars stay around, even if they get rusty. Oh, they're still around somewhere. That guitar, somebody has a guitar and has no idea what they had. <laughs> <laughs> but if it's a telecast, I mean, if it's an Esquire and it's purple, it's probably mine. Yeah. Yeah. 1955. <laughs> I love it. I love it. What, what about amps back then? Were you just using like a tweed basement or something? At the Smithsonian, I did a little presentation. I said, guys, I can't give you the guitar that was played on these songs, but I can do the next best thing. I'm going to give you the amp I played through. And so that amp, the Fender Harvard, is up in uh, Washington, D.C. as well. And uh, I, I, I might I think I did use that amp on the, on the overdubs on, on the Dock of the Bay. Wow. Wow. Now, I got to tell you, man, congrats on this uh, Grammy nominee. How about uh, that? That's pretty weird. Oh, my God. <laughs> I never expected it. 
I mean, that's fantastic. You know, it's fire it up, fire it up. It's called. And, uh, you know, I was listening to this ta- uh, song, uh, One Good Turn. Unreal, unreal. The tones, the flavor of it, it, it just sounds like it's straight up late 50s. The engineer who did that knows me pretty well. He and I had a studio for over 20 years. We've been where we are now for about five years. Next June will be, I guess, six years. <laughs> so he knows my sound and he's the greatest. Eddie Gore is the guy that did it. He mixed that album with me. And uh, John Tiven and I produced it. But the thing about that album is it really is a pandemic album. That band had never been in the studio together. Wow. Now we've done one show, one live show, where we got together and rehearsed the night before the show, four songs out of the album, and uh, and played them live. There was a podcast live thing. And that's, that's the only time we've ever been together. Wow. So they said, are you going to tour with this album? Well, I will if there's a demand for it. But I've been on the road with the blues, doing the blues brothers since that movie was a hit. So that's a long time. <laughs> what was Belushi like? Uh, I'm a comedian, and Belushi is one of the top five influences for me. He's hard to describe, but I will say this. He's one of the nicest people I ever knew. Had a giving heart, and he was just great. He sort of did a lot of things that uh, Elvis did. He'd give away cars and houses and things because he could. I mean, he was... In such demand, he just gives stuff away. And uh, he gave Duck and I royalties in the Blues Brothers album, which he didn't have to do that, but he did at a party one night, pulled us in the bedroom and said, I'm giving you guys part of the album. Wow. Wow. He's just a giving guy. And I, and the thing about it, I used to hang out with him some. And we go to dinner in L.A. And, and New York and stuff. And he never refused a fan an autograph. If it was one fan or 25 fans, he stayed until everybody got an autograph and was happy about it. And he was one of those guys that was so recognizable. People would jump in front of traffic, jump over cars and do whatever they could to get to him and say, I need an autograph. Okay. And he'd stand there and sign autographs just out of his goodness of his heart. He was a great guy. Man, that's a, you know, that Blues Brothers. And that whole thing, you know, Universal Amphitheater and how it just completely exploded. Yeah, it all started with the amphitheater thing. And we didn't know that we'd be accepted like that, but we were. And so uh, what's his name? Miller came to them and said, uh, you know, I'm open. And he had uh, the hit record King Tut yeah. and had him been employed at the Universal Amphitheater to do nine shows, not seven, but nine. Wow. So he goes to John. He says, I want you and Danny to open for me. And so he looked at him and he said, you know, we don't do a stand-up comedy. He said, I don't care what you do. And so John says, can we play music? He said, if you want to. So that's when he just started to put a band together. And he went to uh, Tom Bones Malone, who at that time was the leader of the Saturday Night Live Horns and band. And he said, uh, you know, we've been asked to do these opening dates for Steve Martin. And uh, I said, Miller earlier, Steve Martin and, uh, and, uh, he said, should we take the whole Saturday Night Live band? Well, we did just finished two tours with Levon Helm and Saturday Night Live Horns. And Tom Bones Malone says, well, we could, but you might might want to get Dunn and Cropper. They're old road dogs. I don't know how we got to be road dogs. Yeah, yeah. I guess because we're used to the road. And so that's how we got in the band. God. And Duck and I didn't do anything any different than we'd ever done. We played the same way we played in high school and at Stacks. You know, which seemed to be working. So it worked for them. And we got a lot of flack when that movie came out. And we got uh, interviews, and they were at one of the main questions What are you two guys like you doing playing with these two silly comedians from New York? And I'm going, Well, they're not silly comedians. John used to front a band in Canada before he ever became a comedian. And I said, Danny Aykroyd, Dan Aykroyd really is playing a harmonica. They know that much about blues and music, they knew more than we did. And I think Belushi, we did went to his brownstone in Chicago one time. He had a collection of blue CDs I had never seen before. He had thousands of them all over his den. I mean, I've never seen that many CDs in my life. So he had them all. I mean, you know, it's hard to interview you because your body of work is mind boggling to me. And your playing is ridiculous. I mean, you know, you worked with Beatles here. Here, the Beatles are bigger than ever. Uh, you know, John Lennon, Ringo Starr, and and you were going to do a session with the Beatles back in the day. I mean, this is it's you've played with everyone. What was it like to, you know, 
work with John Lennon. Well, pretty cool. And John said, can you stay after the session? And we were out in L.A. Uh, and I said, sure. He said, I've got a song I wrote years ago I know would be perfect for Booker T and the MGs. And it was a little song called Beef Jerk, as far as I remember. Wow. And uh, he played it for me. And I said, that's pretty good. So I took the riff he had written, took it back to Memphis to my band, TMI. I'd already left Stacks. And we we cut a record on it. I sent it. I couldn't find him again, so I sent it to his uh, secretary. And uh, she, in turn, played it for him, and he loved it and covered it and put it out. And, it, you know, he wrote it, so it is what it is. Yeah, man. That's just it's just <laughs> awesome. Well, I, I did play on his album, and I'm proud of it. But the thing I'm really proud of is, is a couple of things or three things I played on Ringo Starr's album. Wow. And so the, the song Photograph. Richard Perry was going to throw that song off of the session, period. He said, we'll get around to cutting that later. I'm not, we're not going to cut it today. And I looked at Nikki Hopkins, who was with us then, and I said, Nikki, let's you and I go out and put a groove on this thing. And we went out, and I brought the tempo up and just started doing a bang, ding, 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 ding. And <laughs> there it is. Man, man. And it was a song that George Harrison wrote for Ringo's album. He knew Ringo was going to cut an album, and he did that. I played on that song, Photograph. I played on Sweet 16, and uh, the last session I did with him was, uh, I think Mark Hudson was a producer, one of the Hudson brothers. Wow. And it was <laughs> Steven Tyler playing harmonica and kick drum and, <laughs> and his left hand, I guess, on the drums and harmonica at the same time, and I played guitar, just the two of us in the studio. Ringo was in the control room with the producers talking on the talk back and stuff. It's amazing. And uh, they called me one time, and Ringo was on tour in, in Australia and said, Ringo's going to be calling you in about five minutes. He wants you to join his band. And I, I don't know. He worked out something. I never did play with him live, so I don't know what happened. <laughs> but the last time I saw him was the Mojo Awards in, in uh, London, and that was several years ago. Right, <laughs> right. He's such a great guy. He is just super, super, super. And with this new movie, who knows what's going to happen. But I want people to pay attention to when they're on the roof and they showed episodes of that. So <laughs> George Harrison is playing a Rosewood guitar. And I had the first three ever made. I don't have them anymore. I mean, one of them I gave to the Hard Rock. One of them, the airlines messed up. And they pulled one the, the third one off of a TV show. And I took it to Europe and played it. And that guitar I still have. The heavy one went went from New York's uh, venue to, I think it wound up in San Antonio, Texas, at Hard Rock there, I think. The, those all root Rosewood tellies are crazy heavy, man. The next solid Rosewood, then it's got that sandwich piece of blonde maple in the middle there. But they're they're lunkers, boy. But are they are so yeah, they cool. They work. I mean, they do have that Telecaster sound, I guess, because they got the... Uh, the neck right and the pickups right. So that's what it is. What are you playing these days? Like a custom, like an Anderson or something? No, I will tell you what it is, but it is a Telecaster copy. Yeah. And I'm only playing on the neck pickup with the one pickup goes forward. It's made by PV. And the reason is that the reason is I went to Hartley, who's been a friend of mine for a long time. And I said, all these guys want me to autograph a guitar and sell it for three or $4,000. And I said, I don't want to do that. I want a guitar that's a good guitar that when a kid says to his dad, when his dad says, what do you want for Christmas? The kid says, dad, I need a guitar. I'm going to take up guitar lessons. <laughs> so I want a guitar that a good dad can go out and pay under $1,000 for, and it'd be a good guitar rather than paying two or $3,000 with somebody's autograph on it. Because the thing is, if he could find a deal on an old Telecaster, he'd have to buy at least $3,000 worth of foot switch just to make it sound right. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. said, I don't want that. And I was telling this story the other day about a guy who bypassed all that. And <laughs> there was another guy who said, I did the same thing. He said, I had that, those foot switches down there. And I think it was Keith Urban, of all people. He said, I had that. People expect that from me. He said, I bypass all that. I just play one. <laughs> he, the thing is, he had a guitar that sounded good. He found an amp and, you know, that works. And that's why. They said, how do you pick your guitar? It's pretty simple. I unplug it and play it. If it sounds good, then I find an amp that it works with. It. And then <laughs> if I want to use it for recording, I'll find a mic that goes with the amp that goes with the guitar and gets that sound. <laughs> You're only on the neck pickup, huh? On this guitar, I am, because the back pickup is so bright and so hot, it overtakes the sound, and I don't like it. 
And so PV told me, the guys that make the guitars said, if we didn't put in that back pickup, we couldn't sell any guitars. I said, okay. Yeah. Put it yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah. So what happened with mine was that uh, it kept, the pickup kept rattling it. I wasn't using it. And I'd tighten it down to home, and then I'd go back on the road again and start rattling again. So finally, I just took it out, put it a piece of cardboard, and sprayed it with paint. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a fan come up one day and said, man, I love that sound you get. I said, obviously, you didn't see my guitar. And he said, no. And I go get it, and I hand it to him. I showed it to him. And he said, holy shit, that's a, that's a, that pickup back pickup as a piece of cardboard. I said, yeah, it is. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I had it locked down for a while, then then I ro- locked it down permanently one day by running over it. But I only only crushed the electronics down in the guitar; didn't hurt it at all. Oh my God! You ran over your guitar? Yeah, I ran over. There, there's a reason behind it. It'd take forever to tell you the story on it, but anyway. uh, I love you. Well, dude. it took me ten minutes to unzip the case because I knew all I was going to find was a bunch of toothpicks, and I was wrong. And it happened to be next to the garage. And so what happened was I went running out and there was a painting I wanted to take to the office, put it up in the studio. So I had that painting and guitar and I hit my trunk lid and it's full of golf clubs. This was on a Monday morning. It was full of golf clubs from Sunday. I went, oh my God. So I set the guitar around the side and the the painting and put those uh, golf clubs in the garage come back, put the painting in the car, took off. And I went, oh, my God, what did oh, I do? Ah, ah, I, I said, I just ran over something. <laughs> so I'm ah, back ah, real slow. I never did anything again. I see out the front of the guitar. I mean, in front of the car, my guitar. And I went, oh, my God, it took forever. But so happened, I was close to the garage, had an amp in there, and a cord. I plugged it up. It still sounded okay. So I ran in the house and got a backup guitar that I took to the studio. <laughs> And so I plugged the old one up first, and I asked my engineer, if you notice anything different, it doesn't sound right. I said, we'll just get rid of it. He said, no, it sounds, sounds pretty much the same to me. So that's what we use that day. Oh, my God. That's so crazy. And I've been using it ever since. Took it on the road, and guys said, don't ever get rid of that guitar. I said, I'm not going to. But I locked it now. I don't It knocked the plastics on the switch. You know, all those switches have plastic on. It knocked that off. and. And so I just took the back off of it and slowly hammered it back up to the level, top level. And everything worked fine. All the electronics still worked and all that stuff the pickups did. I didn't run over the guitar. If I'd have run over the guitar, I probably would have broke the neck, but I run over the side of it. Yeah. Where the volume and tone controls are. And I just shoved that down in the, in the lamination. That's wow. And back, back on the Rosewood days. I made the mistake one time. I just grabbed a guitar to go on the road with Booker T and EMG. Said I grabbed that full piece of rosewood. That thing whipped me to death. I mean, to me, it was heavier than a Fender bass. And you know, they play them on the chest. I'm down here on my hip, and I'm, it's killing me. Yeah. So I got through the show. Okay, I never made that mistake again. Oh. So I knew it was too heavy when I first when they first sent it to me. So they just sent me that was number one, and they sent me number two. And they laminated number two. It was a lot lighter. So, did you ever get into uh, playing P90s, which was a little dirtier than, but similar to uh, an Esquire? PV, that's their version of a P90, the PV P90 version. Oh, wow. But I did. Went way back years ago, I was at Fender and I said, guys, you're going to have to start making a guitar like you used to. They were, said, they were farming them out to Mexico and different places. And I said, it's just not the same. You use the same wire, same gauge wire, same number of wraps on the pickups and all that stuff. And I said, I'm sick of I reach out and grab the neck like that. And I said, I can wrap the strings right against the neck. That didn't work for me. I play too hard for that. I can't use it on sessions. <laughs> and they said, okay. So they came out with a vintage Telecaster. And then they shared that information with 20 other guys. They came out with 21 guitar players i said okay that's fine i'm not jealous of it i think it's great but it was my idea they didn't give me credit for my idea it was everybody's idea wow (laughs) wow wow so so you talked them back into doing like the 52 kind of vintage reissue yeah and it's a great guitar there's no question about the guitar i still have one but i don't use it on sessions i said i didn't want to damage it yeah yeah i've been trying to tear this guitar up but the one i'm playing right now i've been playing for almost 10 years now i was going to retire it after after i was already planning on retiring it. then i ran over it and i said there's a great story i could probably sell a lot of guitars with that well one of these days i will retire the guitar 
if I don't quit first, I don't know what which will come first, the guitar or me, one or the other. One of us is going to have to stop. Where were we? Where were you when you found out that you were nominated for a Grammy for this record? At home. At home, got the call, and just where you're like, wow. Well, let me tell you about this record. Yeah. You know, it's the first, I know what they say about the record, and I did say that. It's the first one, and I really heard me for the first time since 60 something. But the thing was, that I, the thing is, uh, technically, about this album, it's the only album I ever had out, whether it's had a singer on it or me playing guitar, that I didn't go out and promote. It just happened. And maybe, I don't know why it happened. It, it's either real good. Or it's a combination of being good and my age, one or the other. I don't know. It is good, man. I put it on today, and I was like, this is fantastic. It sounds. I have said before, and I'll say it on the Zoom, if you're not working your butt in the first two bars of putting this record on, you're already dead. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just music that makes you want to groove. It didn't matter about the melody as much as it, the words or whatever. I don't think it does. But uh, it just it's a grooving album. and. Roger Real is singing on it. Roger Real uh, is really singing his kazoo off. He sounds great on this record. And I'm very serious. I wish I had had him back in the old days. But I, when I think back about it, I also had a guy that I thought was as good as anybody. His name was Whitlock, Bobby Whitlock. Yeah. And so he came to the house one time. I said, Bobby, I can't help you anymore. So what do you mean, man? You can't help me. I said, you two, you're the wrong color for me to help you. So I bought him a plane ticket and sent him to the UK and he teamed up with Eric and he teamed up with Delaney and Bonnie. And I had a song, not on uh, Eric's album, but I did on Bonnie and Delaney's album, Move Him Out, that I wrote with Betty Crutcher from the We Three. You got to move him out, move him out, move him out so I can move in with you, baby. <laughs> I love it. I love it. How about Dylan? hits you guys up to play on his 30th anniversary tour, Bob Dylan. I mean, look at these guys. That might be Come fun. On. Yeah, that'd be great fun. He's a great guy, super guy. Oh, my God. And uh, his manager's a super guy, too. And he was in at, uh, at the big room in RCA, and I was coming to work one time, and I hear, hey, Cropper. And I, <laughs> it's his manager. I said, man, I forgot your name. And all this. he came over, and he said, well, I've been here working with Bob. Bob's already gone back. And yeah, he, what a great guy he is. We did his special that time up in New York. So we had finished a show in Mont Montreux, and Duck and I were putting our instruments up. And all of a sudden, uh, this head pops in the curtain and says, Hey, Cropper, hey, Dunn, I want you guys to play on my, they're going to honor me or something on his first birthday or how many years he's been in the business or whatever. I want you guys to play on it. And it was months later. And uh, he, somebody talked to Booker, and Booker called us on a golf course, and we were with Anton Fig. We had just sit playing golf, sitting in the bar, and they said Booker T. Jones is on the phone for you. I said, "Oh, good, put him on." No. So I talked to him. He said, well, "It looks like we're going to be playing behind Bob Dylan." I said, "Okay, let's do it." Wow, that was a great show, and and I, I watch it every now and then. And it's not to me; it's not about us; it's about the other guys on the show. Kellner was on there. G. E. Smith was on there, and those guys, just incredible players. We had so much fun. And, and so when we got through, Duck said, hey, Copper, do you know how many songs we just played on? I said, no, I was just tossing sheet music. <laughs> Go on to the next one. He said, we played on 27 songs. I said, get out of here. Wow. We don't do more than <laughs> 10 or 11 in a show, period. 27 songs in that show. It was about a three-hour show. It was a lot of fun. We had a blast. Got to play on all those hits because people on that show did their hits. Yeah. Why would they do something that nobody had ever heard before? I don't know. <laughs> There's no rules to show off. Just do your hit that's already proven. That's, people can sing along. And so they did. And it was great. How about Duck? Could be one of the greatest bass players of all time. Imagine. What a story that is. He was one of the worst guitar players in our school. Wow. He just couldn't grasp it. And then he came in one day at rehearsal with a bass, playing his kazoo off. And then I found out later he grew up with a ukulele. Four strings. Wow. There's got to be a connection there somewhere. I never talked to Duck about it, but uh, I should have about the four strings. But after his death, I thought about it. I said, you know, he became one of the, if not the world's greatest space player, one of the world's greatest space players. No question about it. The way he approached music and all that, the way he played, every every song he played on, he'd come up with a line for it, some kind of line that you could go down and humming it, go down the street just humming that bass line. And he called me one day and he said, uh, I got good news and bad news. I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, we just got back from Jamaica cutting Eric Clapton. He said, Eric wanted to cut knock on wood, and he did. 
but he insisted everybody play exactly what you play. <laughs> he said, I got homeless on record. I was the only one <laughs> that didn't play exactly what was on the record. <laughs> <laughs> Oh man. I said, Doug, how'd you forget that? Even I know the baseline to knock on wood. <laughs> That's hilarious. Didn't even remember it. <laughs> I think that is one of the funniest stories in life. It's still a great version of the song. Yeah. No question about it. Yeah. It wasn't yeah. something that Eric would put out as a single, obviously. And I knew that. I mean, I didn't expect him to, but the fact that he covered it is pretty, pretty cool. It's fantastic. What about uh Jeff Beck? You worked with Jeff Beck? Well, that is one artist I think got better and better and better and still plays his kazoo off today. He's great. He's fabulous. But I don't think he'll ever top that one song going down. He's not going to top it. Bobby Tense was a lead singer on it. But he played, Jeff just played so good on that song. Oh. And so uh, I have another story real quick. I'm sitting in Clive Davis's office in New York. And he said, you're getting ready to produce Jeff Beck. And I said, yeah. He said, well, there's a little guy named Stevie Wonders written a song for Jeff and I want you to go over to electric lady tonight and hear it. I said, okay. So I show up at electric lady studios in New York and Stevie says, put it up, put it up, croppers here, put it up, put it up. So they put it up and I leaned over and I said, Stevie, put horns on that and put it up. How about a little song called superstition? Whoa. 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 He was going to give that away. Huh? Yeah. You believe that? I said, put horns on that and put it out. And he did. He thought I was mad at him. I started calling. I used to talk to him at least, once, once, once or twice a month, and uh, he didn't answer in my calls. And I said, so I finally got a hold of his manager. I said, Stevie won't pick up the phone. He won't uh, talk to me anymore. He said, Stevie thinks you're mad at him. I said, about what? He said, that song you told him put horns on. I said, get out of here. I'm so proud of that song. <laughs> oh, my God. He is something else. And, you know, he and I have not talked since then. Really? Had every opportunity. Been on a lot of shows together. I don't know. I don't think he's avoiding me, but it's, you know, if we ever ran into each other, maybe it'd be good. But yeah, you know, I know he admires Booker Tini MGs and all that stuff. And he had a great time with that. I know he did, but I saw a video one night and uh, Stevie said, I'm going to call a guy up out of the audience. Jeff, get up here, sit in with us. And he did superstition. I said, now I finally get it. Yeah. It was for Jeff. <laughs> wow. Wow. He played, oh man, did he play good on that song? Unbelievable, man. Unbelievable. I never knew that that song was going to go to Jeff Beck. Wow. That's what Clive said he wrote it for. I don't think, you know, Stevie never did tell me that, but he did play everything on that record except the horns, as far as I know. I mean, he was, it's the same vocal that I heard. You know, on the radio, I heard the same vocal that I heard the night in the studio. So the only thing different was the horns. <laughs> so great. So great. Uh, Awesome. You're out in Nashville now, huh? Yeah. How are you liking it? I love it. I've been here 33 years or longer. My wife and I just celebrated 33 years. I met her here, but I was here about two and a half, three years before that, before I met her. And I was still living in LA going back and forth every now and then. And a buddy of mine lived in LA, uh, a great writer with a big hit song. And uh, he, he said, I'm going back to Nashville to cut some more demos. I want you to go with me. And I said, well, I'd love to, but I got to go to Memphis. I can't do it. And so I got through early in Memphis. I went to hear my son play. And <laughs> so I was done and, and rather than, I, I wasn't ready to go back until like that following Monday. And I said, well, I'll just drive up to, it was on a Saturday. And I said, I'll just drive up to Nashville. I didn't know where the heck I was going. So I just went to the first Holiday Inn and I asked him where our studio was. And I went down there and, and uh, then another I asked them where the restaurant was because my buddies were going to be there. They wasn't at the studio. They'd already finished the day before. And uh, we we went to, uh, it was a restaurant called Mario's at that time. And we went down there. And so I met David Briggs and my friend there. And uh, they, David looks at me and he said, would you like to meet the mayor? I said, well, I guess. And he was sitting over there with the owner, Mario. And I met uh, Mayor Fulton and uh, Mario at the same, day, same table, same time, same day. And uh, it was pretty cool. Yeah, that's great, man. So I didn't say who that guy was. Paul Williams' brother, Minner Williams. Whoa. Wrote, Give me the V-board, Thrill My Soul, I yeah. to get Rock and Roll. Oh, yeah. God, what a tune, huh? That'll be great. Absolutely. But he was a great writer. He wrote that, and uh, his number one records, he wrote one for Alabama that went number one. He wrote with Troy Sills called When We Make Love. Wow. It was a very strange song for Alabama. You know, they were used to doing that, you know, country stuff and 
and they did the ballad thing. It blew everybody away, and they went number one. Do you still play every day? No. No? I'm more like, they said, they told me a story one time about Jeff. They said, do you know Jeff? And I said, well, I hadn't seen him in a long time. They said, when he gets home off a tour, he throws his guitar in the corner and picks it back up when he goes back on tour. Oh. So this pandemic, I learned something real quick. I, I put it in the corner too long. I should have got it out and played some. And uh, guys that get out to just play, play, play. I said, they're not playing for themselves. They're playing to keep their chops up. And I never even thought about that. That's got to be the longest you've gone without playing then, right? Absolutely. But about four years ago, I told my wife, and I love embellishing songs that I've never played before. Don't play. I don't like getting a track the week or, week or night before on the session. I don't even want to hear it. Let me just, you know, go with whatever comes out of the ceiling, whatever pops in my head when I hear something. Right. That's what I'm good at. So uh, I, we came off stage. She did uh, a song, Girl Crush, I think. I'd heard it on the radio, but I'd never played the song. And I, I said, Angel, you know, I, my brain tells my hands what to do. They don't react like they used to. That was about four years ago, four or five years ago. And uh, I don't know. Maybe it caught up with me. I don't know. But I'm a little, a little worried about it, a little discouraged and a little worried that my hands do not react like they used to. I can still play the old stuff. I play that in my sleep. That doesn't matter. But uh, <laughs> Any, any new embellishment, it takes me a while to think about it to get my hands to work to what I want to do. How old are you now? I just turned 80. 80? Amazing. Congrats, <laughs> brother, man. Well, I made it this far. Yeah. Being reckless and doing all those crazy things that musicians do. Yeah. I didn't change. I hung out with the best of them. <laughs> yeah. Oh, my God, you did. Oh, my God, you did. Yeah, and most of my buddies are all gone. They're, they've they're long gone, been gone. Oh, man. Oh, God. I, I got to tell you, man, I got to congratulate you on this Grammy nominee. Bush Hog is a great instrumental. The old school flavor. I love that song, the opening track, you know, and uh, it, it's just really cool to see you still around and you've got this Grammy knot and you are, my friend, a massive legend. And I, I, I can't even tell you how many times I've heard your incredible tone, your incredible playing and your feel it, it's, it's, uh, I mean, no one can duplicate it. I hear these songs covered everywhere I go in my life. And I'm like, nah, yeah, you got, you got the song, but you, you, you don't get the feel. You know what I mean? There's no done. Yeah. There's no cropper, you know, Al Jackson. He was the greatest. Greatest r and drummer to ever live, period. And if you don't believe me, go see the video of a show we did up in Nor Oslo, Norway, black and white. So I make two comments. Either the the uh, guy with the holding the camera was a drummer, yeah. or he just fell in love with drummers with Al Jackson because he stayed on him almost all the time. Pretty cool. And I knew how good we were. I knew we felt good. He was the greatest drummer. And he, he just kicked Duck Dunn and myself in the behind. He made us play. You had to, to stay up with him. And they said, I've been asked before about uh, how were you and Al Jackson so tight? If you didn't use headphones to cut all those songs, how come you guys were so together? I said, pretty simple. I watched his left hand. Wow. So when he came down, I came down. I didn't even think about what I was doing. I just came down with him. And it seemed <laughs> we go back and listen to the playback. I go, wow, that stuff feels pretty good. Wow. Wow. Are most of those songs one takes? I wouldn't say they're one take. Most of them are the second take or the third take after we, you know, we didn't roll the roll of, we didn't turn the red light on in those days, roll the machine until everybody said, okay, I got it. And then we'd roll it. Well, sometimes they'd have it and the singer wouldn't have it. They'd miss a lyric or something. Right. And so we'd have to cut it again. I, I'm pretty sure that uh, Green Onions was either the third take or the fourth take. A song like Soul Man was, I know for a fact, was the third take. That was the one and only time that uh, that Sam said, play it, Steve. And I'm telling you, when I mixed, I mixed that song, cut on four track. I mixed it, but I didn't pay any more attention to the word, to what he said, play it, Steve, than I would have if he hadn't said it. So I, I, I will stick by that to, to the day I die. Wow. Rock and Roll Hall of Famer. That had to make you feel pretty good, right? Getting in in 1992. I don't know. You do what you do. You know, I've always said I have a theory. If you do good, 
you get rewarded in the end. Yeah, that's true. So the guys that expect it the day before they do something, I have pity on them. I feel for them. Not that they're wrong. I just feel for them because it ain't going to last, guys. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So when I get a guy to come in overdub on something, he wants the money right then in his hand. I don't blame him. So we got a song we're coming out with called Get the Money Up Front. Oh, <laughs> shit. Oh, everybody's going to love that one. <laughs> That's great uh, advice. Get the money up front. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> Have you heard this guy, Marcus King? No. I want you to uh I want you to listen to him today. He lives out in Nashville. I'll look him up. I'm not I'm I'm telling you this right now, Steve. This guy is insane. Guitar player, singer, soulful voice, incredible songs. Uh probably 26 now. I met him when he was 24, I believe. Uh Unbelievable. Gonna blow oh, your mind. The, that's the house phone. Somebody wanted to tell me something. Hold on one second. Yeah. They never call that unless they want to, oh the other phone now. I've got two of them up here. I got three of them total. I'll turn it off and the other ones will work. <laughs> 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 I get I do Zoom a lot. I've done a lot of interviews on Zoom. They don't they bypass this. Even they want the Zoom because they want the quality and the, nobody calls me on this phone. That's hilarious. <laughs> Number that's one, if you ain't in there, I don't pick it up, but that seldom ever happens. Yeah. If somebody does call me, it's usually to go to lunch. It's never about, hey, listen to this new song. Yeah. Yeah. Those people are trying to sell something. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, it drives you crazy, doesn't it? It does. It does. Yeah. No, I don't need new insurance. No, I don't need a new radiator. No, I don't yeah. need this. No, I don't need that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, this isn't the fifties, man. People, you know, cold calling people. Hi, well, you need that toner. You know, it's like, what? <laughs> get, get out of here. You know, the last tour I did was with Dave Mason. Yeah. And he, he did a little, he got to talking to his audience and he said, you know, people wonder what happened to the music business. There are no more dish chuckies. And I agree with him, but they're coming back. Yeah. You guys are coming back. And I just think it's great. Somebody you can talk to about music. You either like it or you don't like it, but don't have a guy just programming something out of LA for people that live in New York and vice versa. That's crazy. That is. That is. You're right. Makes no sense. I, I want you to check out Marcus King for me. Done deal. Can't wait to check him out. He's going to make your day today. And, uh, I, and congrats on the Grammy nominee. And I, 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 like I said, man, you are mind boggling to me. You uh, are the man. I'm a lucky guy. And I have played with the best. I agree with you on that one. I definitely have played with the best of the best. You have, man. You have. Thank God I didn't have an ego to run around and talk about it too much. <laughs> and, and so those superstars love me for the fact that I don't treat them like superstars. I treat them like human beings. Right. They love it. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. More and more and more. Yeah. Thank you for doing the show. Absolutely. And tell your fans to look out for the Buddy Holly tribute coming out pretty soon. Oh, when's that? We're going to be doing, uh, in March, I think, a tribute to Buddy at the Royal Albert Hall in London. Oh. People might want to fly over for that one. I've already talked to some people about promoting it. Buddy Holly died the day I was born. <laughs> February 3rd, wow. Buddy. Yeah. Really? Bummer. I love it. Buddy Holly, Richie Valens, Big Bopper. So we're doing a show over here in Lubbock, Texas. Next year. We had one all set for this year. They got canceled. Oh, so you're going to do the Buddy Holly in Love at Texas. Rad. We're going to do that too. So oh. hopefully we can get some of those guys to come over. We got everybody in the world that is anybody's playing on the record. So Awesome. Thank you so much, man. My pleasure. Glad to do it. Anytime. Great to talk to you. And uh, I, hope, I hope to meet you one day in person. You do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you're where now? In New York? I'm in Los Angeles. Oh, you're in LA. Yep. That background is definitely New York. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah but the old flag of New York. I bounce back and forth. I'm a comedian. So I, I go to New York and LA nonstop. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, hopefully I'll be out for the Grammys. We talked about it today. We'll see. Oh man, please hit me up. If you are out here, I'd go to lunch with you. It'd be great. Absolutely. Okay. I'll see ya. Thanks. Hey. Bye.